part two. This morning was part one, so we're going to go to part two. Defining the keys of the kingdom. And I believe you're beginning to understand how and why it is important for us to learn about this good news of the kingdom of God. I began this morning with an illustration. And that illustration had to do with if you ever had a key that you found in your house but you couldn't remember what lock it unlocked then really you ended up with a key that was useless to you and I believe that all of us have experienced that who have at least some keys right uh, I looked at one again just before I left home there was a key in my car and I, I, I can't figure out what this key is for even right now so the, the so I possess the key but the key is useless to me now that illustration is graphic because it describes what happens to religious people religious people have keys it's in this book this is a bunch of keys but having keys and knowing how to use them or knowing what they're for is a different concern so having scriptures but not knowing how they work to unlock the riches that God has in store for us is just as bad as not having a key at all someone said to me uh, he who doesn't read is no better off than he who cannot read the same thing is true of he who has a key is no better off than he who doesn't have a key if he doesn't know what the key is for and so the religious leaders of the day of Jesus had the same problem Christ specifically said to them, he said, you know the scriptures, he says, but you do not know the kingdom of God, which means they had the keys. I want to quickly review to pick up where we left off. We started with a scripture that implied and emphasized the importance of the kingdom of God. In the book of Luke chapter 4, Christ told us why he came. He says, I must preach the good news of the kingdom of God to other towns also. Why? because that is why I came I think that's an important remembrance here tonight and uh, the the emphasis here in this passage this verse is finding out the purpose of Jesus coming to earth notice what he says himself he didn't come really for Calvary he didn't come for the resurrection he didn't come to make to work miracles these things were not his goal these were were means to an end what was the end of his coming he tells us what is it to preach the gospel of the kingdom of God, the goodness of the kingdom of God. This is why I came, he says. So his coming was motivated by the kingdom being delivered to man. The second scripture we read is in Luke chapter 12, verse 32. And it says, do not be afraid, little flock. Why? For your father has been pleased to give you what? The kingdom. Another passage we read, Matthew 25, verse 34. And there's an important one I want to re just review for those who had to work this morning. They didn't get this, all right? Uh, this passage here, Luke, in Matthew, rather, 24, verse 25, verse 34, he says, Jesus is speaking, Come, you are blessed of my Father. He says, Receive your inheritance, which is the kingdom of God. And then he goes on to say that that kingdom was your inheritance how long? Since the creation of the world. Which means the kingdom existed before the earth. The kingdom was given to you before the earth. And that's why he made the earth. The earth had to be created in order for you to carry out the assignment of the kingdom. God wanted his kingdom, his rulership to to happen on a visible planet so he created children first in the spirit and then he gave them the responsibility and then he had to make the territory for it so really the, the earth and the heavens were created the physical heavens and earth were created so God could carry out through his children his kingdom desires so the reason why Christ came was to restore to us the inheritance that was always ours how long did the kingdom belong to you? From the creation of the world that's important so Christ really came our inheritance is not Calvary our inheritance is not even the resurrection the Calvary and the resurrection and the blood and all those things we talk about so much they are really not the good news 
They are the process or the means to the end to get us to the good news, which is the kingdom of God. Let's take another look at another verse in Revelations 5.10. Now, uh, Revelation is the last book in the Bible, so it culminates the entire program of God. And you'll find in this verse, God says in the end, He says that He will make us a what? A kingdom of priests to serve our God, and they will serve Him where? They will reign on earth. I, I, this morning I didn't emphasize the word reign, because we can deal with that a little later. But please kind of tuck that away for a little bit, okay? But look at that. He didn't say we're going to sing on earth, or dance, or clap hands. He said we're going to do what? Reign. Where? On earth. So our destiny is earth. Now religious people say our destiny is heaven. No, our ultimate destiny is still earth because that was the original assignment. Let man have what? Dominion over the fish, the birds, the cattle, and over all the earth. So God created man in his own image and God blessed man and said what? Have dominion over the fish, the birds, and the cattle, and the earth. In other words, God's original plan was earth, and his final plan will be earth. He's going to get what he always wanted. Anything between Genesis and Revelation is a program. It's not the main issue. So we find here then that his desire is to get us back to rule and reign on earth. Now it's important to note here also, uh, this next verse we talked about the law and the prophet. Uh, Luke chapter 16, verse 16 says, The law and the prophets were proclaimed until John. Since that time, since John, the good news of the kingdom is being preached. And that's important because he's saying up to John, the kingdom was not the emphasis. But after John, that was the focus of God. So John... <laughs> is the most important prophet in the Bible. As a matter of fact, Jesus said about John, there's no greater prophet born of man. Why? Every prophet before John spoke about the coming of the Messiah. John actually talked about him coming and then introduced him. So John was the, the greatest prophet in the sense that he was the most privileged one. Because he not only got to say he was coming, but he literally was able to introduce him personally. Now, he goes on to say that when this kingdom is preached, many are forcing their way into it. In other words, people want it when they understand it. Uh, when I was in, in, uh, in London uh, a couple of weeks ago, I was speaking on this kingdom. And I was sharing with them briefly about why people are not coming to Christ. And I, and I picked up this teaching again when I was briefly with Marilyn Hickey a couple of days ago. We were talking about this at the church. I was telling the church that the, <laughs> the Bible says in the ninth chapter of Matthew, Christ says the harvest is what? Ripe. And what? Plentiful. Now, notice he looked at who? Humanity, at the mother to use. And 2,000 years ago he said the harvest is what? Ripe. That means by now, the harvest must be rotten. Stink. You know, if you keep apples or mangoes and don't pick them, you remember what happens, right? They fall, then they start decaying, and then it becomes mushy, and then all the worms show up, and, and then it starts smelling. In other words, the things that taste so good begin to smell stink. Do you know why? Because the harvest was ripe, but you did not pick it. Now Christ says, he looked at the multitudes, chapter 9 of Matthew, verse 13, and he saw them like sheep without a shepherd, and then he says what? He says, they are like sheep without a shepherd, and then he turned to the disciples and says, the harvest is plentiful and ripe. And then that verse ends this way, therefore, don't go to the harvest, go to the Lord of the harvest, Lord means owner, and ask him to send out laborers. In other words, don't go to the harvest, go to the Lord and let him send you if he wishes into, the last statement says, his harvest. Two things here. He is Lord of the harvest, which means what? He owns it. And his harvest means he claims it. Which means every unsaved person on this planet, whether they are Buddhists, Hindus, Muslims, 
Shintoist, Scientologists, uh, Unitarian, Moonies, it doesn't matter who they are, Rastafarians or atheists, God ripened them already. Now what's amazing is, he said the harvest is ripe. So he's not trying to ripen them for you. They are ready for picking. But the problem, he says what? I ain't got no laborers. In other words, the quality of people to reach them is very rare. Why is this important about what we just talked about? He says here that those who understand the kingdom are forcing themselves into it. People want it when they understand it. Which means that if they're not running after something that we have, then what we have ain't what God told us to get. You know what's incredible to me? Every time I talk about the kingdom to somebody, it doesn't matter what they believe before that, they get excited about it. Do you know why? Let me tell you why. Because the kingdom answers man's number one problem. I know what it is. Man's number one problem, I'm going to repeat it again, is... He doesn't control circumstances. That's your number one problem. Nothing feels more helpless than when the doctor tells you, I can't do no, no more for you. How do you feel? Nothing feels worse than when the banker says, your credit rating ain't good enough, we can't give you the money. You feel helpless, don't you? Nothing feels worse than when the fellow say, uh, you, you didn't get the job, thanks for your application. I mean, there's this sinking feeling in life when you can't control circumstances. Well, kingdom gives you power over circumstances. Let me put it another way. The reason why people pursue religion, no matter what kind of religion, is because that religion promises them power over circumstances. The most helpless circumstances we have in life is what? Death. That one we can't stop. So all the religions try to offer you some kind of explanation as to how you can overcome that. But the kingdom of God doesn't only give you power or circumstances in this life, but also in the life after death. Because Christ is the only one who proved that it can be done. You know, Buddha never came back. Muhammad never came back. I mean, I appreciate Muhammad. I read, you know, the Quran, and 90% of it is the Old Testament. So at least I give him credit for, you know, getting his sauce from the good sauce. Yeah. Uh, I appreciate the Hindus. They got 600 million gods. So one got to work somehow. But no Maharaja ever came back from the dead. So they, they're still not certain that they could control the circumstances of death. That's why the resurrection is so important for the world. Because Christ not only showed that we can overcome poverty and lack and the elements like this wind in the ocean, but he also showed we had authority over what? Disease. He healed people and authority over demons. He cast them out. But he also had authority, he says, and I'm going to the grave and I'm coming back to show you that I also got power over that circumstance. That's why the kingdom is so important, because the kingdom promises us authority and victory over circumstances. It has to do with what? Dominion. But now, our problem is, we don't understand the message. So let's talk about what a kingdom is again, real quick. A kingdom includes... This list is not exhaustive, but I'm going to give you some of the basic elements of a kingdom. And that's what Christ preached. First, a kingdom has to have a king. That's a sovereign. Secondly, it must have a territory. In other words, a domain over which it, it has influence and rules. Thirdly, a kingdom must have citizens. Now, I want you to note here that this kingdom we're talking about has been misunderstood and turned into a religion. Jesus hated religion. His number one opposition was from religious leaders, and he kept, they were the only ones he woed. You remember that? Jesus never woed a sinner, but he woed religious leaders because religion reduces citizens to members of religious organizations. Yes. A kingdom does not have members. Church have members. Church religious groups. It's like 
Rotary clubs and key clubs and, and church clubs. We all just a bunch of clubs. We become members. And, and, and so we, do, we don't experience the reality of the kingdom life because we are religious members. My number one goal for the next two years is to transform you from being a religious Christian to a kingdom citizen. Because if I ever get that done, you're going to have responsibility to take charge of circumstances. So a kingdom has citizens. By the way, it's the difference between a citizen and a religious person is that a citizen is a legal element. It's a legal person. They have rights. A religious person has emotions. They appease. They try to appease their God. So they offer offerings. They, you know, uh, the, the, the pagans are religious people. And you, oh, that's a good one. I just felt that one. Uh, the pagans are religious people. So if you study Hinduism or Buddhism or Shintoism or all the isms, you'll find that those people, they keep offering things to their gods, like food or money or fruits. They even cook food for their gods and put it out under the little plates and things. And, and when the rats eat, they say the god ate it. I mean, it's incredible. If you study these religions, this happens. Now, why do they offer those god's things? They tell you why. Because we don't want the God to be angry with us or they want the God to protect us. In other words, if I do this for you, you do that for me. If I do this for you, see, there's this appeasement going on. So when a hurricane comes or a tidal wave comes or, or lightning strikes somebody, they say, the gods are angry, see? So now they're afraid. Oh God, we didn't do something to please that God. That's religion. Well, is Christianity any different? If you give ten dollars, you'll get a hundred. See, we still warped up into that appeasement. Let me tell you something. In a kingdom, you don't appease the government. If you are a citizen, ain't no appeasement involved in that. What's involved in that? Rights. Once you are a citizen, you can make demands. Oh, you don't understand me. A government is there not to be served but to serve the citizen. That's why Jesus says, come unto me if you have your laid not give you rest. He says, cast all your... In other words, it's reverse. In this kingdom, the government works for you. But in religion, you work for the religion. You're not a citizen. It's a very different contamination that we have in our religious relationship and then fourthly every kingdom has a constitution has to have a covenant we call it of course in our constitution the bible and then fifth every kingdom has laws there are laws that have to be obeyed for a kingdom to work and everybody must obey the laws and then number seven every kingdom has a government that is the ruling authority and number eight every kingdom has what say it loud privileges say it again say it again say it one more time Citizenship is a privilege. I want to stress that. You don't have a right to be a citizen. But once you are a citizen, you got rights. There's a big difference. That's why it's difficult to become a citizen of any country. Because citizenship is a privilege and it gives you privileges and what? Rights. And that's why citizenship is so important for everybody in the world. An illegal immigrant has no rights and no benefits that they can demand from a government. The same thing is true about the kingdom of God. You know, uh, Christ was in that synagogue that day, you remember, and the woman was bent over, she was sick, and I tell this story often because it's such a good example of kingdom. And he was sitting there, and, and the Bible says he stood up. Now, he's about to do something. Everybody know, oh boy, here we go again. It was the Sabbath day, there's a woman who was sick for many years. She was bent over, couldn't even look up, the Bible says. She had a problem, maybe a, herni a herniated disc or something, or some, some tumor or something that had a humped over, and she was sick. Who was standing there with Jesus? The religious leaders. See, religion makes you comfortable in your discomfort. Religion makes you accept circumstances as the will of God. Now you all talk to me. Religion tells you, well, it's the Lord's will for you to be like this. See, so religion makes you accept a condition that you got power to change. So those religious people said to Jesus, matter of fact, they said to each other first, they said, 
what is he going to do now? And they start talking among themselves. Oh, it's a Sabbath day. He shouldn't be healing on the Sabbath day. And then Jesus heard them. So he began to talk. And he shifted from their religious talk to kingdom thought. He said, and I believe he might have said it without even looking at him. He says, is this woman a daughter of Abraham? Now where did he go now? He went to contract. Yes. Where did he go? To rights. See, as a religious person, she's a member of the church. But as a kingdom person, she got a right to be healed. Yes. So to them, they wanted her tithes and offerings. Yes. Keep her coming to church. We ain't too concerned with her getting healed. As long as she is in a seat and paying her tithes. That's religion. Religion doesn't give you power to overcome circumstances. Now watch where Christ goes. Christ doesn't heal her because he's sorry for her. Religion is built on making God sorry for you. If I can just God to be moved, if I can just move him by my weeping and by, my, by how bad I feel, and oh God, oh yeah. So if I can just God to feel sorry for me, Christ said, look, I ain't going to heal because I saw him for at all. Let's go to rights. Is she not a daughter of Abraham? Yes, she's a Jew. Good. Now, didn't I make a contract with Abraham? Yes. That there will be none of these diseases among you. Is that right? Yes. So once I can identify that disease ain't supposed to be among you, then you have a right to be free from it. You know, he didn't ask whether the woman was a believer or anything. Oh boy, I tell you. You don't get things from God. Boy, it's going to be rough now, boy. Oh dear. It's tough to teach us, you know, because I get in trouble. You don't have to be saved to get things from the kingdom. Now how's that for a shocker? <laughs> see, see, okay, you are a Bahamian, right? You're a Bahamian. Okay. Or you are an American, or some of you are from England, all right? British history. Okay. Now, whether you black or white, red or yellow, does that make a difference for you to have citizens' rights? No. Once you're a citizen, doesn't matter. Suppose you speak Spanish or French, you don't speak the language of the country. You still get things, right? Once you're a citizen, you got rights. What if you are a Catholic, a Baptist, Methodist? Do you still get rights as a citizen of your country? Sure. What if you are a Buddhist or a Hindu or don't believe in God at all? They still got to give you your rights in your country, don't they? Because it doesn't depend on these other things. Once you are connecting with the government authority, you got rights. Now let me prove it to you. The person who understood the kingdom of God the most was not even a Jew. I rest my case. He was a pagan centurion, a Roman. But he understood how kingdom works. This man didn't worship Jehovah. Matter of fact, he was sent there to keep the Jews down, to keep them in order. He was in charge of 6,000 soldiers, centurion, powerful guy. And his servant was sick, his personal aide who got sick. And obviously, he was tolerating Jesus in these crusades for a while. You know, in his, in his area where he was in charge, this young man came from Galilee, the 30-year-old guy having these meetings. And I believe his soldiers were on, were on duty to make sure there was no riots, because that was their job to keep, make, you know, keep everything in order. So I believe the centurion came many times and listened to this young man preach. Listen to Jesus talk about this kingdom. And he was intrigued at this guy. And he also, of course, observed Jesus, you know, doing things and probably heard that he healed people. But now he has a problem. What do he have? What, what does he have? A circumstance that he cannot control. So, do you think he tried everything he could? Yes. He has money. He got a power. 
So he sent the guy to doctors, I'm sure, in the area and tried everything. The guy wouldn't get well. So he says, let me try this guy who taps into another source. Well, I'm getting excited now. Everybody's a heaven. Yeah. See, when the doctors finish with you, you better have another key that can tap into a heavenly health source. So this pagan centurion decided this man could heal my servant. So he came to Jesus. He said what? He says, sir, uh, my servant is sick. Before he was finished, Jesus responded. That, that, that's interesting to me. Because usually Christ didn't volunteer. But in that instant, before the man finished, Jesus volunteered. He says, my servant is home sick. Christ says, I will come and heal him. Then the man said, you don't have to come. Well, you're going to study this kingdom thing. It's heavy. The man said, I understand what you understand. You and I got an understanding. <laughs> the understanding is this. Caesar is in Rome. I am thousands of miles away from Rome. I am in Palestine, here in the Middle East. But my kingdom's headquarters is in Rome, Italy. But I am all the way here in Palestine and my authority yes. in Italy released me with the same authority in Italy. So when I tell a soldier, go, he doesn't hear me, he hears Caesar. Because of what? My relationship with Caesar. When I tell one come, he comes. When I tell one go, he goes. Why? Because I am a man, quote unquote, under authority. You see, the key to get stuff from the kingdom is you got to move under its authority. And this pagan man shifted and opened a lock my lord he used the key the guy shoved the key in of authority Vop! he said i know that even now if you say you are healed and send your word like that he says i know that the same way my word works yours will work and jesus responded listen now he responded he says, I have never seen. So great. You're talking about Pharisees, scribes, Herodians. You're talking about religious people in Judaism. He says, look, this man has more faith than any Jew I've ever met. You got to study what this man knew. The man knew simply a key of authority. He said, the way you get things done is to understand authority. And if Jesus said, go your way. Your servant is healed. And the Bible says when he went home, the same hour Christ said that, that's when they told him that the boy got up. You see, the privileges and rights in a kingdom comes from what? Citizenship. I believe that centurion after that follow Jesus no doubt about it because once you get that kind of response you got trouble leaving and ignoring that that source of authority yeah the next one kingdom has codes of ethics and every kingdom has what an army we dealt with that a little bit we can do that later on in the conference in the in the series rather but an army is what the angels eh? The angels the angels take care of the citizens one of the important things here is the fact that in a kingdom the citizens do not fight and that's important because religion has made the church an army 
Nowhere in the Bible, now I know it's a tough statement, but nowhere in Scripture is the church ever called an army. But how many books are written that the church is the army of the Lord and we are in the battle? Jesus never says it and he never teaches it. Matter of fact, he says that he's given his army charge concerning the citizens. So the kingdom of God, if you really understand it, makes you in charge of the army. Now who do the army really fight to protect? The citizens. Let me ask you a question. When you become, now this is going to be deep, okay? When you become a soldier, what do you have to give up? Huh? Citizenship? Do you realize that? When you become a soldier, you are no longer a civilian. That's heavy. In other words, if you, I believe God says, look, if you religious people want to become soldiers, then I can't take care of you, you can take care of yourself. That's why you're fighting so much. The angels are so upset at you because you won't let them do their jobs. It's a whole new thinking, huh? Daniel had a problem. I mean, what do you do when you have a problem and you're a citizen? You pick up the phone and you call the police. That's the army. And when you call the police, who's calling? The citizen. <laughs> I love the way it works. You got the power to pick up the telephone if someone is violating your rights. And you can call the military, the law enforcement agencies, and they have to come. Have to. If you're a citizen. You got authority over the entire police force. That's mind blowing. Not only do they come, but they put a siren on the top of their car and stop everybody else to get. Y'all don't know what I'm talking about. When Daniel picked that phone up and says, Lord, I got some problems down here in Persia. The angel left the headquarters. On his way down, the siren was on and there was a traffic jam of demons and the angel Radioed back and said, Michael, I got a problem. Michael can't. <laughs> Open the way. Y'all talk to me, somebody. Doc, Daniel did not fight. Say it with me. Daniel did not fight. Say it again. You know, all this stuff we're talking about, intercessory prayer. And, see, we got to study that again. Intercession simply means waiting until the police comes. <laughs> Woo! Daniel just what? Waited. Just 21 days. Daniel said, listen, I can afford to wait because my government doesn't lie. They told me that they dispatched somebody. And if I got to wait 21 days, the guy is coming. And when the angel showed up, the angel said, Daniel, I have come. Here's why. Because of your words. He said, the day you prayed, when the phone call came to heaven, that was the very day the government released me. Tell your neighbor, there's an angel on your way. Come on, tell your neighbor, there's an angel on the way. Tell your neighbor, don't give up. Keep believing what you prayed for. Clap your hands and praise God. That's what prayer is all about. Hallelujah. You know, when you pick up the telephone to call the police, you don't have to talk loud. Y'all know. Some folks pray, Lord, God said, look, just call. Just, he can even use a cell phone, just walk around and... <laughs> See, that's why I'm going to write a whole new book on prayer next year. Because prayer has been just one big religious experience for people. <laughs> oh, you can't handle this. Tell your neighbor, I'm relaxing tonight. Let the army do the problems. 
Let the drama do the problems, man. Don't you do the problems here, sir? Christ said, cast all your kids. Man, I mean, the angels handle that. When you read the Bible, every situation was handled by angels. Yeah. When Joshua showed up and he saw Jericho, he so said, they got a problem. The next thing showed up was a man, an angel. He was dressed in what? Military gear. Now you all talk to me. Joshua said, uh, are you with them or us? His answer was interesting. He says, I am the captain. The guy says, look, you think I look mean. You just see the guys I'm leading. I'm just the captain of what? The host. Host means what? Armies. In other words, Jericho is in trouble today. Come on, lift your hands. Praise God. Hallelujah. <laughs> You got it? Yeah. But if you are a religious Christian, this don't work for you because now you are the army of the Lord. No wonder why you get whooped every single day. They whooping you. The demons whooping you. You can't fight against flesh and blood. Use flesh and blood, man. Citizens have rights to command the army. Hebrews chapter one last verse says are not angels ministering spirits sent to serve those who are heirs of salvation they're here to serve us well how do you get this kingdom to function on you I brought this scripture up because I wanted to just show you that all Christ really thought about was the kingdom. Now before he died, he preached the kingdom for three and a half years. And all he taught was the kingdom. Now he went to the hell, he got the keys, he rose again. Now this is after the resurrection. Let's read what it says in verse 2 of Acts 1. It says, after his suffering, that's Calvary, he showed himself to these men and gave many convincing proofs of his, his being alive. That was what? His resurrection. He appeared to them over what? A period of 40 days. That means after he was raised from the dead, he was on earth for 40 days talking to these guys. Read the last statement. What does it say? And he spoke to them about what? One subject, the kingdom of God. He didn't talk about Calvary, didn't talk about the blood, didn't talk about even the resurrection. Because Calvary, the blood and resurrection were the means to the end of getting the kingdom back in them. That's why Christianity is such a depressing religion. Because we sing a lot, but we can't pay our bills. I mean, that's frustrating to say, I got the victory, I got the victory, and then you ain't got none when you go home. <laughs> Something ain't right. Come on, let's not let's stop fooling ourselves, man. I'm a king's kid. But you can't pay your mortgage. I mean, something's wrong with those two statements. If your father's the king, you can at least pay off your house. That's why Jesus told the disciples, I mean, to the Pharisees, he says, you know something? You guys know the scriptures. But you wouldn't enter the kingdom or wouldn't let the people enter. And then he... Oh boy, I better not use that because you're only going to forgive me. Anyhow, he says, woe. Woe means damned. He cursed them. Who were they? Religious leaders. What were they doing? Keeping the people out of the kingdom living. Tough, isn't it? Look, look what was on his mind after the resurrection. The same thing that was on his mind before the resurrection. He spent 40 days with a seminar teaching them on the same thing he taught them for three and a half years. But the kingdom. <laughs> Acts chapter 1. Same chapter. A couple of verses down. So when they met together, they asked him, Lord, are you now going to establish and restore the kingdom of Israel? He says, look, you guys are crazy. His answer was interesting. What did he answer? He said, look, you guys misunderstood. I'm not here to knock off Caesar and wipe out Pilate. I'm not here to establish some military kingdom. They were still thinking Judas, Jewish messiahship. Because the Jews were expecting what? A military leader. 
Christ says, no, you missed it. He says, even though you read Isaiah about the Messiah, you, read, you, you misread the details. The details said that he shall become a suffering servant. He shall be disfigured and he would hang on a tree and, and, and he would not be worthy to be looked at. In other words, you guys are looking for a military leader and I'm coming as a suffering servant to set you up to receive the kingdom again. He told Pilate, you know, Pilate, when Christ confronted Rome, was when he confronted Pilate. That was Caesar representative. And Caesar said to King Jesus, are you a king? Jesus says, yes, I am. You know, you say it right. You say it correctly. But then Jesus says, let me explain something to you, though. That's the first time he ever spoke in the trial, okay? And I appreciate him speaking. He never spoke to Herod because Herod, Herod was a fool. The guy was paranoid, okay? But when he spoke to Pilate, he was speaking to who? A kingdom person. So he knew that Pilate would understand kingdom talk. So Pilate says, are you a king? Christ says, sure. You're right. You said it. I'm a king. He says, oh, by the way, uh, I better let you know that my kingdom is not of this world. He said, because if my kingdom was of this world, my soldiers would fight for me. In other words, I, if, if, if I was going military, you would have been my servant. <laughs> tell, you know, tell him, Pilate, Pilate, you're lucky I ain't going military because I could call 10 legions of angels right here and right now and wipe you out. You remember when he was arrested in the garden? Now, this is, now, this is good, this is good, good example. This is a religious person get taken into action? Who was a religious person? Peter. <laughs> Boy, religion like to fight, eh? Ready to fight. They come to arrest Jesus. Peter says, Shout! Touch him. Touch me. <laughs> Tell your neighbor, you ain't got to defend the kingdom. Tell your neighbor, God, no, you can't defend your own kingdom. <laughs> How can you defend the kingdom of God when you can't even pay your rent? Peter pulled out a sword and started to fight for Jesus. Religious mentality. What did Christ do? Christ says, no, Peter, put your sword up. I don't need you to fight for me. He picked the guy air up, put it back on, and then he says, look, he says, even now, I could call 10 legions of troops. A legion is 6,000 soldiers. 10 is how many? 60,000. How many moved the stone? One. If 60,000 them big boys show up, you know, you might as well let Jesus go. <laughs> what was Christ getting across? This ain't military. Now, the disciples disappointed him. They're still asking for a military kingdom. His answer was interesting. His answer was in the next verse, verse 8. He says, but you stay in Jerusalem. Because this kingdom is what? In the Holy Ghost. You shall receive the Holy Spirit and power. And you shall be what? Witnesses unto me. In your home, Jerusalem. In your job, Judea. In your community, Samaria. And to your whole world. That's your nation. He says, you will be what? Witnesses. Now here's an important I said this morning. We don't understand the purpose for a witness. Witness doesn't mean that you take tracks and you go along the streets. This is what religion makes it. That's why the people ain't getting saved. Because you're going around giving out tracks and, and forcing people to come to you. You saved? You, you know Jesus? You die, you go. What you smoking for? You better stop drinking. I mean, see, and we attack people. Yeah. That's not witnessing. Christ says, you will be witnesses unto me. Not to the people. You got to read the verse carefully. Now, how do you witness unto a person? Well, it's a legal term. In other words, in a court of law, if I claim something to be true, and I am the plaintiff, or I am the accused, no matter, it depends on who you are in, in, in the box. If I claim something, and I tell the judge, I'm going to bring witnesses to prove what I say, then everyone I bring to that courtroom as a witness unto what I said, they have to bring what? Evidence. You see, in the courtroom, words are not where power is. It's evidence that's the power. If you bring words, you could lie. 
So all this talk about, I'm a king's kid, I am God's child, I am... I am, I am. See, and that's why you break, you're poor, you're sick, you're depressed. And you say, I am God's child, but you're broke, you're poor, sick, and depressed. I am God's child, but you're broke, poor, sick. So he said, look, you ain't witnessing to me. I told you, I told the people that my kingdom have overcome the kingdoms of the world. It has power over every circumstance. He says, now get in the box and show them the evidence. What is the key to the evidence? Power. Not talking. Power. In other words, things that work. It works. Christianity don't work. But I know I'm rough on Christianity because see, because I, I used to be a Christian. It doesn't work. Now I, I, I know this is tough because it, 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 it just it cuts, you see. But think about it. Be honest. I'm honest. That's why I'm living the kingdom life now. It's a beautiful life. See, religion makes you lie. I am healed, I am healed. You're sick. You're getting worse. I am healed, I am healed. No, 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 no. You ain't, somehow you ain't unlocking something. Jesus, Lord have mercy. There's a key that you ain't, you, it ain't working for you. Am I speaking the truth? I mean, I mean be honest. Come on, be honest. Lift your hand if you, if, I, if, you, if you're sick and tired of a, a Christian that ain't working. Let me see your hands. See, look, look, look around you. You ain't alone. Man. See, don't you get, don't you wonder sometimes? I mean, I'm reading this book with it, nothing working. But they're making me say things. I'm well, I'm well, I'm prosperous, I'm healed, I'm blessed. But it still ain't working. So guess what? You are a liar in the court. You ain't got no what? Clap your hands and thank God for the truth a little bit. Eh? Oh, hallelujah. Tell your neighbor, I want to be a kingdom citizen. Tell your neighbor, I want to learn how to live in the kingdom. Well, that's our next point. How do you live in the kingdom? I figured it out and it works. Here it is. It's found in beginning in Matthew 13, 11. Jesus replied, the knowledge of the secrets of the kingdom of heaven has been given to you, but not to them. In other words, the kingdom has some secrets that make the kingdom work. That means that you can be in the kingdom and still starve to death if you don't know the secrets of the kingdom. Now, I want you to underline a word, please, in your notes. Write that verse down. Underline the word of. Knowledge of. Not knowledge to. Can I have a bunch of keys, please? Thank you, Pastor Rich. All right, I got a bunch of keys here. Now, let's say that Pastor Richard comes to me, gives me this bunch of keys, and says, I'm going away for five years. Here are the keys to everything I own. And he gives it to me. Everything I own. Here are the bunch of keys. I got the keys. What's the problem? I could be there for years trying to figure out. <laughs> I don't know how to get into anywhere because... I don't know the secret of the keys. Okay. Did he leave me the house? Yes. Now, here's the way the kingdom works. Getting in the house is easy. Because if you read the Bible, there's no key to the kingdom. It doesn't exist in the Bible. There's no key to it. But there are keys. Read it again. I will give you the keys of the kingdom. Chapter 16, verse 19. Matthew. I will give you the keys, what? Of, not to. Okay. So now Pastor Richard says the front door is open. But all the other doors are locked. So I'm in the lobby. Most Christians die in the lobby. There's a room full of health. There's a room jam-packed with food. There's a room full of peace. There's a room full of victory. 
There's a room full of this, uh, uh, of, uh, of uh, dominion. There's a room full of money. I mean, there's rooms full of all kind of stuff. But you're stuck in the lobby because you can't figure out which key. So what do you do? Watch this now. It's going to be good. What do you do if you got keys but ain't got the secrets to them? What do you do? You experiment. You keep trying this verse. You try another verse. You try another verse. But that verse, don't wait. Let me quote this other one. You keep, and for 10 years, you're still quoting. I come back and you have dead. <laughs> what are you doing while I'm away? Quoting scripture. But well, what happened? You don't know how to use them. Man, talk to me, man. You're busy and you're quoting, but you're experimenting. Look at the first statement again. He says, the knowledge of the secrets of the kingdom of heaven has been given to you, but not to them. Who's them? Them other people right around you. That means you're supposed to be living right next to your neighbor. And in economic crisis, they losing their house and you building too. So now they're trying to figure out, now wait a minute, we're in the same economy, same neighborhood, same conditions. What's your secret? Now you got to tell them, I got some keys that can unlock another realm <laughs> that's above our economy. You all understand how deep this is, man. If you go back to Egypt, the kingdom was in action, you know. God said, Moses, uh, I'm going to bring a farm in. But tell all the children of Israel, and they must do this and this and this and this. He told them instructions. What are they? Secrets. He, he said, don't tell the Egyptians what I tell you. So they did it. And guess what? The Bible says the farming hit the land. Farming means economic crisis. Crops died, no business, economy fall apart. <laughs> Slap over the land. The Bible says, but in the, in the house of the Israelites, there was abundance of food, but their neighbors were starving to death. Let me tell you something friends and this is going to be deep if you become a kingdom person it doesn't matter what imf world bank g7 or any because you're operating with some other keys and they don't know about The trick then is what? Getting the knowledge of the secrets. He didn't say the secrets, you know. It's the knowledge of them. So here's my punchline for tonight. Yeah, I want to get this to you. Watch this. Matthew 16, 19. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, not two now, of whatever you bind on earth, will be what? Bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Okay, now, now, I was brought up in a religious environment that misused this verse. Because this verse has been applied to binding demons and loosing angels or something. Or binding money and loosing money. Is that right? I mean, come on, let's be honest. As a matter of fact, the charismatics have really perfected this particular verse. They perfected this one. Now, but have you noticed it ain't working? You know people, man. They bind this stuff and they ain't never get bound. Loose and stuff and they never get loose. Why? Misuse of verse. That was you call experiment with the key. I hope this work. Read the verse. The verse. The verse ain't got nothing to do with no demons. He's talking about functioning in the kingdom. He says, I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Now, <laughs> the the Greek word for bind is locked. The Greek word for loose is unlock. <laughs> He's talking about a lock. He says, look, whatever you unlock on earth, heaven have to unlock for you. Whatever you lock up on earth, heaven is locked up with. So if you don't know how to open up something, then heaven cannot get it to you. 
You get it? Someone get it? He says the key to getting stuff out of heaven is learning how to unlock, how to use the keys of the kingdom. Now, it's so wonderful, man. Do you know the next verse is? And we're going we gonna to teach you on this when we study the keys individually. Because what I've done is I've gone through the entire four Gospels myself. I've peeled through every single line. And I have found all the keys. I'm a dangerous man. I found all the keys, brother. And they are in there. Let me give you one. Right after this verse, verse 19, the next verse says, And if you offended someone. Now, who is he talking about? He's talking about keys. He says, look, you unlock heaven up fast, have unforgiveness. <laughs> he says, the way you lock heaven is unforgiveness. The way you unlock it, is forgiveness. He says, and if you do not forgive, then your father shuts down. He can't forgive. And if you forgive, then the father forgives. So here you are in a religious service singing, I love you Lord and I lift my voice. Sound good. But you bitter against the member across the the hall or you just had a big fuss with a member of your family and you hate their guts and you hold in bitterness and here you are I love you Lord heaven is as cold as an ice crystal I mean there is a metal door slammed shut up there you just what locked up heaven yes. So the Bible says, if you bring your offering before the Lord, there's an offering, your worship before the Lord, and then remember that someone has, ought, not you now, they have ought against you, but you know it. It says, don't try to offer your offering. Why? Heaven's locked up. Go and make it right with them first. Heaven <coughs> opens the door. He said, then come back and see if I won't pour you out a blessing that you can't contain. How many Christians standing in church meetings singing loud and bitter at everybody at home? It's one of the keys is forgiveness. It's just one of them. It's forgiveness. So if you're going to live in this kingdom and operate this kingdom, you got to make sure you always have a right spirit with everybody. That is why Jesus said, isn't it this? Okay. If you have an enemy, then what does that mean? They offended you, right? If you have an enemy, they offend. They are the offender. What? The offender. Guess what? This, this kingdom is strange. This kingdom says, if if you are offended by anybody, so you must go and make it right. Why? Because one of the keys of the kingdom is you must be what? A peacemaker. Blessed are the peacemakers, for theirs, they are the sons of God. These these are the ones who God claims to be His children. A peacemaker means that I make the peace. I don't wait till you call me. I am the peacemaker. Let him hurt me. Ah, he let him come to me. God said, no, no, no. In this kingdom, heaven's locked up on you. So you don't wait till they initiate the peace. It's a strange kingdom, isn't it? Why? Because the kingdom says you can't have nothing in your life that offends. Otherwise, the place is locked up. He says, so it's up to you. Whatever you lock up on earth, heaven locks up. And when you lose it on earth, heaven loses it. Well, you all are quiet. You know why? It's down to the practical stuff, isn't it? Yeah, see? It's the nitty-gritty of the kingdom. See, that means you can live any moment with anger, bitterness, malice, deceit. Why? Heaven is a cold steel door locked. Imagine if you would live in that way in the kingdom, man. There'll be no hatred, hurt feelings, fighting and divorce and brokenness. Peter says, if you married, 
He says, live with your spouse sensitively. He says, least your prayers be not answered. You shut your whole life down. But I ain't speak until he speaks. Listen, let me tell you something. <laughs> you can't afford that. <laughs> but I wasn't the one that was wrong. God said, this is not the issue. The issue is there's offense in this house. So every prayer ain't working. Heaven has shut the door. Hmm. The Lord's prayer. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. That what you're praying for? Thy will be done. Know what you're praying for? Good. Honor it. That's your request, right? Next verse. Give us all we need for daily bread. No problem. God said, okay, I got your request. Now let's get the next thing in. Forgive us. In other words, heaven ready to release this thing you asked for now. But God said, blocked up. Why is that in the prayer? He said, because that's how you unlock the thing. Forgive us our debts as we forgive those who offended us also. And then while we at it, don't lead us into another one. <laughs> what? Well, can't afford to be offended? No offend. Tell your neighbor, this is good stuff for you. Tell your neighbor, you better love me and forgive me for your own sake. <laughs> Look at verse 10. The king, the knowledge of the secrets of the kingdom of God has been given to you, but to others, I speak in parables so that those seeing they may not see and hearing they will not understand. We can deal with that sometime later on. Luke 11, 54, 52 says, Woe to you, experts in the law, because you have taken away the key. Oh man, look at what he says. See, you never saw this stuff before. He says, you experts in what? The law. These guys knew the scriptures. They memorized. Man, listen, tell me. Let me, let me tell you something. Yeah. Memorizing scripture don't get it done. Amen. These were experts. The kingdom doesn't work for you because you know the whole book of Galatians. These guys, let me tell you what, these guys didn't read the Bible part time. <laughs> this was their full-time duty. But listen to the words of Jesus to these religious leaders. He says, Woe to you, teachers of the law. Not just experts, but teachers of the law. You hypocrites, because you have taken away the key to what? The key to knowledge. I'm talking verse 52. What did I say is the key? knowledge of the keys you've taken away the key to knowledge you yourselves have not entered and you have hindered those who were entering Matthew 23 13 woe to you teachers of the law and Pharisees you hypocrites you shut the kingdom of heaven in men's faces you yourselves